back, you know, we had, were struggling to get electrics. We were just wondering what's going on. The electrician was walking up and down for three hours trying to find the fault. The readings were, we, we do a reading up here, it goes down there, oh, there's a fault there, and the reading is different. You come back up, the reading is different, goes back down there, there's no fault. So that was going on for what, three hours. Never mind, in the end, we won. The gremlins didn't. <laughs> well, it just goes to show that when, you know, somebody doesn't want us to reopen, it doesn't want Christians to gather because when Christians gather together, the power of darkness trembles and because of Jesus. So we had to go through a lot and still we have hiccups here and there, but hopefully next week we'll iron things out with Zoom people as well. Sorry this morning, uh, people are on Zoom, there are quite a few on Zoom. Uh, sorry for the uh, technical problems. But next week we will sort it out. You can join Zoom comfortably, I guarantee. Praise the Lord. This morning, I don't want to take a lot of time. I want to talk about teachers and teaching. That's new, isn't it? <laughs> teachers and teaching. But who is our greatest teacher? We know that. It's Jesus. So we want to talk about teachers and teaching. Now, first of all, I want to read Isaiah 30. Uh, 18 to 21, or just 20 to 21, sorry. It says here, And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whether you turn to the left. Doesn't make any sense, does it? But in Ahab's time, this is talking about teachers, this is talking about prophets in the Old Testament. Whenever a prophet goes to a nation, they kill them. So they don't want to hear their teaching, they don't want to hear the word. And then they kill them. And, and in, in, in Kings, uh, 50 prophets were hidden in the cave because their lives were sought after. Because they were preaching the truth and telling the truth. And this is exactly what's going on in centuries. And we all know that. Uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, throughout uh, the, the centuries before, false hood, false teaching is always there. So it's nothing new under the sun. Today we have a lot of false teachers, false teachings, and you know what? They are the majority. And that's how it looks in the Old Testament times. They had to hide, and they were put in a corner, but no more. God says no more. And this, this is the reason. Because today the word of God, the famine of the word of God is at hand and teachers of the truth got to prevail. They've got to come out and they've got to be in the assemblies and this is what God is trying to do. There's a lot of false going on all over the world, which a lot of majority of people are following, millions and millions. But yet, the truthful teachers, the teachers that are sound in the word of God are in the minority. That's why today God is bringing out all these teachers who will stand on the word of God and teach sound doctrine is very far and few between. But yet God is raising. They are not going to be hide, hidden in the corner anymore. They will come out and you shall, your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And that's what's going on today. Okay, that was Isaiah. But there's some other scriptures I want to share this morning. But yet, whatever time I have left, here this morning is to help the hearers, us, all of us, to teach others more effectively. You may wonder, oh, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a school teaching a classroom. It doesn't matter. You are a teacher in every way because, you know, we may not have gone to university or or have degrees or colleges, but still we have our disciples, still we have our people who look at us like our children, like our friends, like our colleagues in the workplaces. They look at us. If you say you're a Christian, they are looking at you all the time. They're just making uh, you aware that if you make one false move or one, one hiccup, then they will pull you up. But that's beside the point. What we're talking about today is we may think we're not teachers because we don't stand before a classroom or anything like that, but these people with us are watching. 
They are learning like children learn from their parents. They look at their parents. That's why today it's sadly to say a lot of families have problems because the children look up to the parents. The parents are not right and the children are not right. It goes down in generation. But we are always teaching with our lifestyle, with how we conduct our lives, how we, how we portray, how we live, how we talk. We are actually teachers, whether you like it or not. Somebody is looking at you and learning from you. You may teach well or you may teach badly. It doesn't matter, but you can be sure that the people are learning from you. And they look at you. And if you're doing the right things, and you know, they, they will follow the right way, the right things. Jesus did not go to university, we know that. Or training college for that matter. So far as we know, he never stood in the classroom to teach. But you know what? He taught 12 men by living with them for three years. That is more effective than teaching in the classroom. Because he put his whole life into it. His whole being, his whole you know, teachings and doctrines into the lives of those that are with him. Maybe we can learn from this, his way of teaching. If you're a teacher today, and if people are looking at you, nevertheless, you know, even though you don't stand in front of the classroom to teach, but you're still a teacher. People are learning from you, looking at you. So, if we are being teachers, and if people are looking and learning from us, why not we follow the teachings of Jesus and the way he teaches? Here it says, Jesus' teaching was with authority. Authority. Sadly, the other religious teachers of his day did not speak with authority. They, they, they didn't. Because Matthew 7, 29 says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So here, if you look between the lines, Jesus is teaching with authority, not as the scribes. So what are the scribes teaching? Scribes you know, it, 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 it symbolizes religion. Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees, they are religious people. So what are the religious people teaching? Sound doctrine and sound teaching only comes from the Lord Jesus. And this is what we got to hold on to. This is what we got to learn and live by and teach in our lives. Because with authority, Jesus teaching with authority. But, you know, all these religious people say, well... I think this, I think that. And even, you know, today some of the pastors in so-called churches are saying, if what the Bible says is true, how can you make statements like that? That's no authority in it. There's no authority. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, here is the truth. And then he teach the truth. So he declares, here is the truth. It's not that, oh, it's maybe. There's no maybes in teaching the, the word of God. Because it's all facts. And the truth is there. Jesus was uh, special. We know he was special. He was fully God and fully man. But nevertheless, as a man, as he lived here on earth for 33 years, his teaching was full of authority. And that's what we've got to learn. That's what, how we've got to act our lives and teach in our, in our lives to others. Speak with same authority. Can we ever hope to speak with the same authority? We might ask. Because I, I met a guy in, in, in uh, Henley Wigan many years ago. And we were talking about, I was teaching about the disciples. That, Richard, you don't believe that we can be like the disciples, do you? What's the difference with the disciples and us? They're just mere men walking with Jesus. The only privilege they had was they were walking with Jesus bodily. Are we walking with Jesus today? Of course we are. So, you know, this is how they are, this is how people look. You can't be serious, they are disciples, we're not disciples. We are his disciples, by the way, John 15 talks about it. Yes, we can, with the authority. The authority behind Jesus' teaching uh, still is available for each and every one of us today. He used the Bible. Jesus quoted scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, all the way in his ministry. And this is how we need to live our lives. We've got to understand the teaching was with authority and we need to stand with that authority to teach others like Jesus did. 
Because we have it. God has given us that authority to stand on his word. We are his children, heirs and joint heirs. He's given us the power of the Spirit of God in order to minister. Secondly, Jesus' teaching was biblical. Don't draw conclusions from your experience and make doctrines out of it because you can't. The only doctrine you can make out of it is from the Bible. And the Bible doctrines are there for us to teach and use. So Jesus' teaching was biblical. He drew his teaching from the Old Testament. If you, if you look, Jesus quotes the Lord of Old Testament, the disciples, Paul, they all quoted the Old Testament. And you, you can't discard the Old Testament because it's Old Testament. Because they are both together. All of God's word is all in these 66 books. You can't pick and choose. The words of scripture have a remarkable power to convince people. Hebrews 4 12 says, For the word of God is a living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. This is the word of God. And this is the word of God we have today in our lives. And we go hold on and cling on and live and, and stand upon it. Because it's truth. Just like Jesus said, here is the truth. This is the facts of the Bible. Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. He came. He was born in a stable. He grew up in Nazareth. His ministry started when he was 30 years of age. And look at what he did. These are all facts. It's not a myth or a story 2,000 years ago. And that's what we're going to stand on. Because the word of God is a living, powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Church, we all are teachers. Today, how are we teaching? How are we portraying our lives to others that they can learn from us? These are relevant questions we need to ask. Thirdly, Jesus' teachings was revolutionary. Was revolutionary. You know, the Beatitudes, look at the Beatitudes itself. You know, on, on, on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew, it's, it's all there. But the world's beatitude, let's look at the world's beatitudes first. The world's beatitudes are, Blessed are the strong in spirit, for they are highly respected. Blessed are those who live in a high life and are always cracking jokes, for they are popular. But Jesus' beatitudes are entirely contradicting to the behavior of the world. That's for sure. Because Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, we read that all the time. We hear it all the time. But let's look at it. The word blessed refers to the well-being of those who, because of their relationship with Jesus Christ and his word, receive God's kingdom. So our relationship with Jesus is important. And, you know, as when we walk and we have this relationship with Christ and his word, we receive God's kingdom. We belong to the kingdom of God. We it, it included love, care, salvation, daily presence. All these are included. When we have Jesus in our lives, nothing can change that fact. It's a fact. Church, we all need to have a poor spirit. You know what? Some people don't like, you know, having a poor spirit. It doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound macho. It doesn't sound strong. But you know something? Because we are not spiritually self-sufficient. That's why. And Jesus knows that. That's why the, the, the teachings on the Sermon on the Mount is practical, is, is real, is relevant. And Jesus spoke in, in his time with parables because people are thick. They couldn't understand it. The same thing goes today. People are thick. We are thick. I am thick. But you know what? When we when we get rid of that mentality and actually tune into the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and be committed and loyal to the Word of God and try to understand as best as we can and also whatever you understand if you teach, then it stays with you. And that's what we've got to do. Blessed other poor in spirit because we are not spiritually self-sufficient. We need the Holy Spirit's life, power, and sustaining grace in order to inherit the kingdom of God. Church, we can say we're kingdom people because the kingdom of God is within us. That's what the Bible says. 
But yet, if we can't portray the kingdom of God and show it to somebody else, then what's the point? If you follow all these things, all these teachings of Jesus on, on Sermon on the Mount, then we can be kingdom people. That's why we've got to strive towards that goal. We have to set goals, you know, in our lives in order to achieve and accomplish all of that, in order to be a child of God, in order to belong to the kingdom of God. So if we are going to be teachers, because we are, whether we like it or not, might as well do it right. So that people can benefit from us and through us. Hunger and thirst. Five, uh, in Matthew 5, 6 says, Hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is not the way of the world or the teachings of the world. The teachings of the world is always self, isn't it? Selfish. Me, myself and I. Me, me, me. Give me, give me, give me. And that, that's the world today. And, and we need to get out of that mentality. How can I give? How can I help? That should be the opposite way of our thinking. Because we are kept here on earth as salt and light of the world. And we need to be effective if we are, if we are one. If the salt loses its savor, what's good is it? Is it? It's nothing. You, you get trampled and thrown away. And, and you know, it's just bad. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is the one of the most important verses in the Sermon on the Mount. The fundamental of, of foundational requirements for all godly living is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We are weak. We know that. God knows that too. We are all weak. But yet, God can give us the strength if we are willing to surrender our lives totally to Him. And try hard as a human being. Because God not going to do it for you. We've got to put our effort in. You know, if we are going to be molded and, uh, you know, by God to build our characters, we've got to play a part. If we don't play a part, God's going to zap you and change your character overnight. He's not going to do that. We need to have that hunger. Uh, yielding ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm hungry of your word. I'm hungry more of you in my life. That's why John the Baptist says, I have to decrease as he increase. And this is our Christian life. Even John the Baptist said that. So if we decrease in our lives and more of Jesus in our lives, then we can actually get that strength to hunger for more of his righteousness. That's important, church, today. And we need to understand all that. You did say, oh, someone to the mount, I've read it all. But do you really understand it? Are you exercising it? Are you practicing it? That's a different story. And, you know, that's, I, I'm, I'm sure all of you know Christianity is not an easy road to walk. But yet, it's so rewarding and benefiting. Because God is involved. It's not religiosity, stained glasses in the steeple. You go in there and you just hear all the waffling and you come out. You don't grow. I've been in religion. For 10 years I was attending this Anglican church. I never grew because I never learned anything. This is how it is. God has to be involved in our lives so that we can grow together with him because he enables us, he equips us, he molds us, he makes us. That's what God does. The hunger in our lives, God needs to know. Then he will give us. You know, when we're not hungry, he won't feed us. But when we're hungry, when you ask for food, he will feed us, obviously. Just like a parent does. Such hunger is seen in Moses. Seen in the psalmist, seen in Paul. If you read them, you know, about all these people, you, you can see their hunger. Look at Paul. I like to have all the sufferings of Christ in my life. I want to know more about Christ. And look at his life. He was taken up to the third heaven. He saw things that he couldn't utter, mysteries. He was so privileged because he wanted to know more. He was hungry. God gave him that opportunity. Church, the spiritual condition of Christians all throughout their lives will depend on their hunger and thirst for the presence of God, 
for the Word of God, for the communion of, the, of Christ, the fellowship of the Spirit, the righteousness, kingdom, power, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. All these things we need to hunger for. We need to be waiting for that imminent return with hope. But now a lot of Christians talk about the return of the Christ. These are all part and parcel of our Christian life. We need to be hunger. We, we, we need to have that hunger for the city that God has built that we've got to get there for eternity. And these are the hung, hunger that Jesus is talking about. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Christians hunger for the things of God is destroyed by worldly anxiety, deceitfulness of riches, desire of things and worldly pleasures. When they creep in, the hunger for righteousness flies out of the window. And that shouldn't happen as Christians. We may fall, we may be weak, but we still got to hold on to that hunger. Even though we have, we've not been fed because we're not that hungry, but yet, if we are striving towards that, that's victory. Better than being, you know, taken over by worldly anxiety and deceitfulness and riches and desires of things and worldly pleasures, which brings, at the end of it all, destruction. They will die. If you are destroyed by that, you will die spiritually. You won't die physically, obviously, but you'll be like a zombie, just following things that are led, you know, by, by the things that have been led, you're just following. But if you're a spiritual person who knows and hunger for thirst for righteousness, then we will receive the kingdom of God and all in it. And that's a beautiful thing. That's why, for this reason, it is absolutely essential that we be sensitive to the Holy Spirit convicting work in our lives. The Holy Spirit is always convicting us, all the time. And when we are being convicted, we need to listen. Jesus' teaching was revolutionary. This is what it is, the Beatitudes. Not like the world. For Jesus practiced what he preached. So if we are teachers, we need to practice what we preach. If we say to somebody, hey, don't swear, this swear, swearing is not good. And the, the person turns away and you start swearing this side, that's no good, is it? Because you're telling them not to swear, you yourself are swearing. Just an example. Because human nature sometimes is difficult. Because the carnal man still flares up, carnal woman still flares up. Jesus practiced what he preached. He came to die as a sacrifice. He told them what is going to happen to him, and yet he went through with it. Just an example. He never got out of it. After saying that he's going to do it, he did it. Five, Jesus' teaching divides his hearers. You might wonder, well, how can I be that kind of teacher when whatever I teach gets di divided? What it divides, when we talked about the two-edged sword, it divides carnality with spirituality. That's what it does. True Christian teaching always divides because it calls for a personal response. Personal response. Bible is full of examples. In the last days, sons, fathers, daughters will come against each other. Families will come against each other. For my name's sake, Jesus said, if you have me, others will hate you. That's for sure. And the Bible talks about if you want, if you, if you want to try whether your gospel is not, whether it's effective or not, go and preach to a Jew. That's what it says. Because in, in John 7, the Jews were seeking to kill him because of his words. They were seeking to kill him because they were offended. The gospel will always offend somebody. That's why it divides. It doesn't mean that your gospel is not effective. 
when that happens, it is effective. It is effective. When somebody gets angry, when you preach to them about the love of Christ, then because it is effective. And all you need to do is keep praying for that person. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit will help you and enable you. In the end, that, that person can be convicted by the Spirit of God. I can, I can understand that, I can vouch for that, because when I was preaching to my father, day in, day out, every opportunity I have, it just offends him so badly. One day he's very quiet, he, he, he's, he never speaks, you know, he, he's a very quiet type of person, but yet it provokes him and then he gets offended, but one day he couldn't stand anymore, he stood up and said, I declare that I'm not going to receive Jesus. Wow. And you know what? I just had to pray, keep praying, keep praying. And one day he had cancer of esophagus. And he was hospitalized and was dying. One of my colleagues from the church went to visit him and talked about Christ. And that offense and that rejection became mild and softer and softer it was ironed out and you received Jesus at the end. So you know it, your gospel, your love that you share about Christ will always offend somebody but don't give up this is what I'm trying to say. Don't give up one day the Holy Spirit will convict that person because it sees him so. So these are the lessons, these are the things that we need to follow. Preach with authority, share with authority have a revolutionized message. Live your life. Practice what you preach. Because your teaching and your sharing and your lifestyle will always divide and offend somebody. But that's what the Word of God tells us. So don't get discouraged when things don't happen. We are called to preach the gospel. That's a great commission. And we've got to hold on and cling on and carry on with it. So church, this morning I want to ask you, what about your teaching? Is it biblical? Is your teaching, I think, or listen to what God says, here's the truth? Or maybe we need to stand clear on the word of God. No matter whether we are up against the whole world, we can stand up and say, this is the truth of God's word. That's who we are in Jesus Christ. If you're any lesser, you, you can't win anybody. Church, we got to stand firm, even though the whole look at look at Elijah on, on Mount Carmel, 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah, one person only, stood up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know the story. In the end, Elijah won. So the majority don't think it has a big war, or don't think it can overcome it. You can because you have Jesus. You only need Jesus, one person in your life. You can overcome everything. So let's be great teachers. Teaching great things of God. Teaching the scripture with boldness and authority. Backing up whatever you say with the Bible. Don't bring in your experience and, and say this is true. Yes, it can be true. But you know, biblical based experience and biblical teaching must be you know, your, your effort of, of presenting it first. Then you can bring in how God has changed you in your life. This is how it works. Because then people will understand in the long run as you pray and as the Holy Spirit work on that person. Do not, do you practice what you preach? Is your teaching revolutionary? Does it bring people to the point of decision? Church, why, 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 why am I saying these things? Because we still got to work a lot in this world. We still got a lot of time. Youngsters, you know, all growing up. We old people are growing older. So you all got to come up and take the torch and run with it. That's what we need. And come next year, you know, even though through this pandemic, we can still work. I'm not saying, you know, to be unwise and go into the affected society and go and preach the gospel. I'm not saying this at all. You've got to be wise as serpents. So church, this morning, what kind of teacher are you? Because we all are teachers, whether you like it or not. Let's be great teachers. 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.